Since it's your show and you asked me to come on the show, I'm more than happy to do it. You just ask me whatever you wish and I will answer you absolutely truthfully. Tell the world about your new documentary. Please just go. You got the floor. I want, I want, I want you to recoup the sale of your house for doing. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, it's, that, it's fantastic. That, it really is. That's sir. very, that's very funny. I will never recoup, recoup the sale of my house or the enormous amounts of money that I put into the film, but I have absolutely no regret telling the story of Jim Garrison. It's got nothing to do with courage, Bill. It has to do with the fact that knowing the truth about Jim Garrison's case and how he solved it uh, when he arrested Clay Shaw in 1967 and announced to the world that he had solved the case and that he said that elements of the Central Intelligence Agency killed our president. And again, he repeated it on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson to thunderous applause, I might add. And, of course, he was sabotaged by the government. They had nine Central Intelligence Agency uh, uh, agents infiltrate and sabotage his office. And, of course... The documentary reveals the birth of fake news, which also not only helped to destroy Jim Garrison, but it created fake wars from the Cold War with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had lost 25 million people in the Second World War. They were absolutely no threat to the United States. It created the fake war of of Vietnam. We all know that. It's recognized by everybody. We know that Iraq was a fraud with weapons of mass destruction. I tell a lot of people not to view my film. There is an old Persian proverb that says, if you're going to tell the truth, you better have one foot in the stirrup so that you can make a quick getaway. I tell people, a lot of people, not to watch the film because as Jack Nicholson said, in a few good men, you can't handle the truth. It is very difficult to recognize that our government and the Central Intelligence Agency since November 22nd, 1963, when they occupied the United States of America, destroyed democracy, created what everyone now recognizes as an oligarchy. If you realize that you cannot do anything as an individual about the fake wars that your government pursues. Why do you want to learn the truth about something that you can do nothing about? The film shows how it is so easy to resolve it. Uh, September 5th, when I interviewed Mr. Garrison, he gave me a large list of people who were still alive who should be questioned about, arrested and questioned about the murder of John (laughs) Kennedy, of course. Well, a lot of those people have died, but a number of them, at least 10, are still alive to this day who should be questioned. And at the end of the film, I put together a wanted poster and I deliver it to the Justice Department. Most Americans do not know, because as Jim Garrison said in the documentary, the fact that the House Select Committee overturned the Warren report that said Oswald did it, The select committee said there was a conspiracy, which may or may not have involved Lee Harvey Oswald. And they turned their findings over to the Justice Department, where it's still a cold case. So if everyone got together and stormed the barricades of the Justice Department on November 22nd every year and made it America's best steel day, we might find out the truth and get a real investigation into the murder of John Kennedy by these people who aided and abetted them. And Garrison said to me in the film, I mean, aside from the fact that they had to have the help of the uh, Dallas police force in great numbers, that there were members of the media who also assisted in the fraud It's in order to build up the fiction of Lee Harvey Oswald before the truth sank in. 
And the one who led the way, of course, was Dan Rather when he reported to the nation that when the bullet struck Kennedy in the head, his head went violently forward. And, of course, in those days, there were, were only three networks. And so we believed the networks. We thought there was such a thing as a, as a free press. But Garrison points out that with the birth of the Central Intelligence Agency in 1961, they created something called Project Mockingbird. The Central Intelligence Agency, as Garrison points out, did not need to be created. We have dozens of intelligence agencies, but the main purpose was to change the hearts and minds of American Americans to support continuous war because the depression in the 30s was only ended by World War II. And when World War II ended, it was a threat to America. Peace was a major threat because if you have a million and a half men coming back to the United States, how many toasters can you make? How many refrigerators or cars can you make? And if they last for a couple of years, you're into another major recession. But you can build a bomb for $8,000 and explode it in two seconds and keep building bombs. And that's where America is to this very day. And to show you how smart they are, Eisenhower, sadly, his last speech when he left office and turned the country over to a young 43-year-old man, he said we have to be aware of the growing power of the military-industrial complex. Well, they have so totally overwhelmed us that Boeing aircraft, Boeings, are no longer necessary to be made. They're outmoded. But they will continue to be made because they are so smart. They have contracts in 50 states in the United States to build separate parts for a useless plane. So any senator or congressman suggested we should get back on the road to peace, get rid of this outmoded bomber, There are going to be a few thousand people out of work in his state, and soon he'll be voted out of office. That's how smart they are. We are spending four and five times as much money, Bill, on fighting fake terrorists than we did in fighting the Germans and the Japanese. It is just absolutely pathetic, the condition that America is in. in. And the other thing that I point out in the film, which is so easy to resolve. The worst president in American history is Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton destroyed America. Bill Clinton signed the communications, which turned 95% of all of our media over to six corporations. When John Kennedy was president of the United States, a company in 1963 could only own five television stations, five newspapers, or five radio stations. There were 1,500 individuals who and corporations who owned radio and television and newspapers. All you have to do is reverse the Communications Act and have them divest themselves, these six corporations, of all their holdings because it's a monopoly and let them maybe own five or six or seven individual stations, there is no longer the public airwaves. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. And right now, not only is it used as a propaganda agent for these fake wars, but look at, nine. I would say 95, 75% of all commercials on television are about pharmaceuticals, most of which kill us. If you look at any commercial, Bill, it... For about eight seconds, it tells you its value. And for the next 22 seconds, it tells you how it can cause you to commit suicide or die or dreadful. They should never allow anything advertised on television that is harmful or needs needs a warning. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get carried away. Well, into you, you, you're, one you're doing. Uh, yeah, I think the worst uh, side effect is anal seepage. <laughs> What do, you, what do you mean by anal seepage? Well, that, I've never that, heard that expression. Oh, oh yes. It, yeah, a lot of medications, uh, one of the side effects is anal seepage. I don't know if you... Honest to God, oh. I, 
I've never heard that. That that is absolutely hilarious. You know, a comic could get huge laughs and earn a huge living just just by getting up on stage and reading a bunch of these commercials. I remember when I did the uh, the Tonight Show with Frank Sinatra, and he had me on, and I did a monologue. And w- one of the jokes that I had was that you know you no longer have to write jokes about politicians in order to get laughs. All you have to do is quote them. Well, it got a huge laugh and major applause. And the same thing holds true if there's such a thing advertised some pharmaceutical that results in anal seepage. I think that's what it sounds like. It's CNN's motto or slogan. News with anal seepage. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you speak of Frank Sinatra, and I listen to you so often on Jeff Rents, and I just love Rents, and you know I love you, sir. But, yeah, your life. Uh, what is your book now, about 3,000 pages long to come? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, it is, I think when it's down to it, Bill, it probably will be close to 800 pages I had a major agent say to me that he could get a very large deal for me if I eliminated the first half of my book, which is about my struggling childhood, and just did all the inside stuff about show business. And I wrote back to him and I said, listen, I do not do tabloid. And I guess I I presume then in that case, you would have neither sold Angela's Ashes for Frank McCord or Catcher on the Rye for J.D. Salinger. And he got really upset at me, but it's true. You know, there are millions of people in this country who have totally, totally miserable childhoods and made more miserable by the fact that there are seldom a mother and a father, a full family in the house. And the other reason is if there is a full family in the house, There is probably no stay-at-home mother because, like her husband, she probably has to get a job now to help pay pay the bills. My story of coming from a severely dysfunctional family in Canada long before it was possible and a life so miserable that I ran away from it, hopping trains to come to the United States when I was 15, I was lucky, first of all, because fortunately, I, I guess I was gifted with a a good mind and a good sense of humor. I guess that might have been my talent. But the thing is that all the wonderful things that happened to me, Bill, in my life all happened by accident. And the good, the worst things were those things that were really well planned. So I've had this happy accidental life. um, And I was indeed fortunate. And the reason I wrote about it, because... You know, when I was a kid, one of my favorite authors, of course, was uh, Charles Dickens, David Copperfield and Oliver Twist and all these poor kids. Well, I was one of them. And in the Dickens books, they all survived. And in my life, I survived, too. So I thought that was a necessary part of the story. Yes. A very successful writer on his own took a couple of chapters from my book and turned it over to his editor at a quite a successful publishing company. It's in their hands now, but I do not care if a major publisher is not interested in my book because paper in many instances is becoming passe. I could kindle it and put it up on Amazon. That would make me extremely happy because let's face it, the mainstream media has avoided my documentary. Worse than that, the leading assassination communities have gone out of their way, to, except for Judith Baker, to avoid even talking about my documentary because they're busy selling $20 DVDs about outmoded JFK material or they're spending their time trying to sell their $20 or $25 books when you can go to Amazon for a dollar ninety nine and see the most definitive work ever about the murder of John Kennedy and the birth of fake news. So why on earth would they plug my film 
which shows you how the case was solved and how we could further solve it. And they avoid it. But in spite of that, it is a, it is a monster hit on Amazon and is doing surprisingly well on Vimeo. And the reason I put it on Vimeo is because except for Germany, you cannot get Amazon in Europe. You can't get it in Asia. You can't get it in Australia where I'm sending DVDs. And so I put it up on Vimeo for $4 so people around the world can see it. So it's doing extremely well. And I expect my book may even do as well or better than the film because there are numbers of people who don't care about John Kennedy. It's ancient history. They also realize that there's nothing they can do about it. I've said often that, you know, I have democracy in America. Well, there is no more democracy, but democracy in America is like owning General Motors stock. I have General Motors stock and I get to vote every year, but I have no say on the design of the car. I have no say on how many miles the carburetor is going to get. I have no say whatsoever. You have no say when you vote in this country about anything. Mark Twain said it a hundred years ago. If voting made a difference, they wouldn't let us do it. That is the most brilliant American writer who ever lived and probably the first novelist in history because he is the first writer to create or recreate the actual speech of people in Huckleberry Finn. He gave birth to the modern novel. And there's been the two greatest writers in the world, obviously, are, are William Shakespeare and Mark Twain. Two of, they're two of my favorites in print, aside from Ben Hecht, who wrote the best book ever about sh- somebody in show business called The Child of the Century. But in television, my idols were Jack Parr and Ed Merle. And I love Jack Parr because... I did not know that people spoke to one another and that you could earn a living doing it. Because in my household, in the households that I saw as a youngster, I never saw anyone having a conversation. And right now, I can attest to the fact, as can you and everyone listening, anyone with an iPhone never has a conversation or they exchange opinions. They don't converse. I've seen people in a restaurant, a young couple sitting opposite one another having dinner. Each one has the, uh, his or her phone in their hands. And I walk by and I say, are you texting each other? And they're not. They're looking at something else. And if they're having a conversation at all, it's not a conversation. One waits till the other expresses opinion about something, and then he or she throws in her opinion. We are becoming separated from one another as individuals. And it was all planned. The people that own this country, the the half a dozen families that own America, got to own America because they're smart and not because we're not smart. And we aren't. We don't, we, we don't, we don't meet anymore. There are no more labor unions. Ronald Reagan saw to that. When he did destroy, destroyed the, 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 air, air, the air traffic controllers right. years ago. So anyway, go ahead, ask me whatever you, you okay. want. I want to, I want to, me- I want to slip in there. Uh, you know, you were saying everything that got you through your childhood and your ability to run and hide the story about the day you got a bow and arrow and your stepfather started shooting at you. Well, it wasn't my step. It wasn't my stepfather. I never had a stepfather. Oh, it was. It yeah. was one of the one of the many uncles uh, right. that my <laughs> mother brought brought home. And sadly, uh, my mother was. I don't know whether she was just extremely lonely or an infomaniac and an al- alcoholic, but she came home frequently with a strange man who became an uncle for a while and chose her as a punching bag. And the worst of this was this military drill sergeant. His name was Garth. He used to beat the crap out of her unmercifully. I would have to jump out of the house, out of the back window, the upstairs window when I was 11 years of age and run to the cops and bring the cops. And when the door was open, there would be my mother with her makeup back on and 
arm in arm with Garth saying, you know, nothing was wrong. And the cops would tell me to go in the house. I said, I'm not going in there. He will kill me. He will kill me. So I had to talk the cops into parking outside, which they did often. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of, a lot of youngsters go through that. And in the cases of a lot of young women, they find themselves sexually molested either by their fathers or their older brothers or uncles. I mean, that is a child molestation in families is an epidemic in America. Fortunately, none of that happened to me, but I, I was constantly assaulted by homosexuals. But, you know, I figured that was part of life. I would just push them off, and that was the end of it. And only once was I ever severely attacked and bitten by one, but I never complained to anybody about it because I was able to fight them off. Oh, yes. So... That's now it. when I, now when I look at what's happening to, you know, Al Franken and Conyers and all the rest of them and, uh, this, uh, producer, uh, Weinstein in Hollywood, you know, a lot of these women, I must say, could have said no. And a lot of what Franken did was not really horrible. Patting a girl on the rear end is not sexual assault. I mean, it's over familiarity, familiarity and really bad manners, but it is not sexual assault. And as Franken said, as he was pulling out of the Senate when he retired, he said the worst molester of all is still in the Oval Office. And there you have a guy sitting in the Oval Office that we have to call President of the United States who was on record as talking about how he bragged about grabbing women's crotches because they love it if you're famous. And the, and the, and the audience or the voters knew that and still voted for him. And the reason they voted for him was because he was not Hillary, Hillary Clinton. Clinton. Yes, yes, it's, yes. It's almost, and you know, a couple of times he talked about 911. He made reference to the fact that he knows building and it wasn't the planes that brought it down. And that got all the progressives excited. They thought, oh, maybe he will investigate it. He never spoke about it again. Yeah. And then he talked about uh, this uh, guy. Oh, jeez, I forget the politician's name, whose uncle was with Lee Harvey Oswald, whose father was with Lee Harvey Oswald distributing le leaflets. A fair play for Cuba leaflets in New Orleans. God, I can't think of the guy's Cruise. name offhand. And so everybody thought, hey, maybe he is right. Maybe he'll do something about the Kennedy assa assassination. But it was all talk. Right. That was Cruz, Absolute right? Talk. And I have no idea what is going on between him and the intelligence community. I have no way of knowing, except that I do know all this nonsense about Russia voting for Donald Trump or getting us to vote for Donald Trump is absolute and total nonsense. All of the emails and all the information that Julia Assange released, and I must say, the only honest thing I've heard an American anchorman say in five years is that Julian Assange has never released anything that was not proven to be true. You listen the to documents Sean Hannity he released, too? These, these documents were supplied by disenfranchised DNC Democrats who loathed the fact that Hillary Clinton sabotaged Bernie Sanders. They're the ones who released the documents. And one of the guys, which is Seth Rich, he got murdered for crying out loud. And that's gone in, un, uninvestigated. They're trying again to make Russia... The enemy, the same way they did in 1945 when they were not the enemy. If it hadn't been for the Soviet Union, Hitler might have succeeded. He made a total blunder when he invaded the Soviet Union because they could never survive those winters, ever, ever. Let me let me give you a little inside scoop, Mr. Brooks Agnew. Uh, he was in Washington uh, at Trump Towers and... He's written a book about he's can, made all the connections where all these people from Obama and Holder, where they all came up 
And what Obama did in 17 days before Trump was inaugurated was he put the 17 agencies together and they became the dark state. Obama knew what he was doing before he left because these agencies were not supposed to talk to one another. So he made it okay for them all to become the dark state. And anybody that doesn't want Trump there because he's going to destroy their lifestyles and their criminality are fighting him. I, I well, got you may recall that Fletcher Prouty wrote a book in the late 60s, or early 70s about the deep state. And uh, that book disappeared very, very quickly. Fortunately, I have a copy of that book. And when I interviewed Prouty for my very first documentary, The Garrison Tapes, which came out in 1992, and he was the one that identified. He didn't personally identify, but he felt the picture of that fellow walking casually past the three tramps. Now, if you look at the three tramps who were arrested in Dealey Plaza, they are not handcuffed. They're not even watched closely by the cop walking in front, who is smiling, and the cop walking farther behind them. There is about five feet of space between these five people, and anybody could get close to them. Now, if they were real suspects, the cops would have kept everybody away. There was a guy walking in the opposite direction past them at whom one of the tramps is looking. And Fletcher Prouty spotted the ring on his left hand, and he thought it looked like a Navy ring or a or a West Point ring or something like that. So he blew out the picture and he sent it to a couple of his aides at the Pentagon and just said, who does this look like to you? And they all said, it looks like General Ed Lansdale, who absolutely loathed John Kennedy. And Curtis LeMay loathed him even more. As a matter of fact, Curtis LeMay was the one, like Dr. Strangelove, for crying out loud, who wanted to bomb Vietnam with nuclear weapons and he had shouting matches with Kennedy and Kennedy turned him down. Now they were unable to perform autop an autopsy at uh, the Naval Hospital because at one point Dr. Human said, who's in charge here? And it turns out that General Curtis LeMay has been identified as a guy who was in charge of stopping the autopsy. I mean, it's all common knowledge. I mean, any idiot knows it. Everybody knows it. And they will do nothing about it. I, I mean, w- America is totally, totally lost. Well, I, I, watched, are- I watched a compilation of, of just about every news anchor and, and independent uh, networks all saying that this document dump isn't going to tell us anything. It's a nothing burger. Of course, Lee, Ar- Lee Harvey Oswald did it. It's the media. Well, it, it, it's it's an emotional thing. I've said for years and years, and I tell a wonderful story about when Jane Fonda came on my show in 1970, when she was known as uh, Hanoi Jane, and everybody wanted her hung as a traitor for going to North Vietnam. She was extremely shrill. And I said to her, you know, that most people, human beings do not think. Human beings are not reasoning creatures. Human beings are emotional creatures. We are raised emotionally long before our brain kicks in. And and nature designed us to recopulate and, and repopulate the planet when we were 12 or 13 before we were smart enough to realize it wasn't such a very good idea. And the reason for that is very obvious, because if we were all reasoning creatures, we'd all be atheists or we'd all be all be Presbyterians or Catholic or Jews or Republicans or Democrats. But we're all something different. And the reason we're different is we only use our minds to justify our emotional makeup. These people believe in a God, but they don't know there is a God. They just don't know. And it's just as simple as that. So wasting your time talking about God is as much of a waste of time as trying to correct the warmongers that run our country. Can't. They are going to destroy themselves. 
And the movie ends with one of John Kennedy's most brilliant observations. He says, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. And I predict that within the next two years, there are going to be massive riots in America, but it is not because America wants the truth about anything in this country. It's not because America wants to stop all these fake wars. It's because Americans want to eat. They want food. Do you know that in Vegas on Thanksgiving, there was a church that had 2,000 turkey dinners for the homeless? And nearly 6,000 people showed up. So 4,000 people went hungry. Now, that's one church in Las Vegas. How many churches were there in America on Thanksgiving giving that built turned away hundreds of thousands of hungry people? And it's getting worse. I mean, look at, look at the student debt. Do you know how, you know, I have heard people talking about the fact that before Lincoln freed the slaves, the slaves had better lives than Americans today because slaves were fed and, they, of course, they were forced to work for free, but they got free housing and they got free food. Those people were freed by Lincoln and in their place because of the birth of the Federal Reserve, we have all become debt slaves. We own our own homes. I mean, we live in our own homes, but we don't own them. We have mortgages on them. And we and to pay our mortgage, 99% of all Americans are debt slaves. And we, in essence, we have it worse in the eyes of some than in the black slaves prior to the Civil War. And look at student loans. If you have a child and take out a student loan for your child, and your child dies, if your child dies at 30 and owes five or ten thousand dollars, your estate or her children have to pay that debt. And that debt grows exponentially every month, not every year, but every month because of the interest. I know students who took out a twenty thousand dollar loan who owe one hundred and eighty thousand dollars today. I mean, that is a sin. And Bernie Sanders was the only politician who ever talked about that. But to me, and I predicted this when he started to run, he's going to turn out to be the Democrats' Ron Paul. Ron Paul was the only one who wanted to talk about auditing the Federal Reserve and and talk about peace. And then, of course, he could he ran off. He's one of these people that proved that he could not live up to his own word that he could not b- live up to his belief in the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution about two parties. He could have run as a third-party candidate and thrown it into the House of Representatives. Bernie Sanders had 12 million supporters, most of them under 25 years of age. Hillary Clinton at times could not get 32 people to come into her uh, or, or speech, listen to her speeches. Trump had hundred, uh, thousands and thousands. But they weren't young people. They were all 40s and 50s and 60-year-olds who talked about restoring America to greatness. When I asked Garrison, uh, here's a guy who was an FBI agent. He was in the military. He was at Dachau after the, he helped uh, release uh, and free the prisoners at Dachau. He has a picture on, on his wall, the only picture in his office. He's sitting on the wall. He said, lest we ever ever forget well for crying out loud that doesn't exist in america anymore and when i asked him as an fbi agent as a colonel as a soldier as not a republican or democrat as an independent whatever made him think that he could take on the federal government he said two things he said first off john i think as a kid i saw one too many frank capra movies well that was me as a kid bill I used to haunt the theaters. I fell in love with Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart movie. To me, that was America, but it's a myth. That America is a myth. It's always been a myth, but I believed it as a kid. It's the same reason some people, many people believe in God because they're taught this myth as children. 
And it's very difficult to grow up and realize it doesn't work. It just does not work. Religions are all man-made. Political beliefs are all man-made. Therefore, they're all dysfunctional. The only, the only, there are no mistakes in Mother Nature. Mother Nature instilled into every living creature on this planet what I call the three F's. And that's all Mother Nature wants from us is the three F's. Fornicating, feeding, and fighting. And the feeding and the fighting or to fornicate. Nature only cares about our being reproduced. And you can see it is such, it is the prime urge in all living creatures. I mean, if you watch monkeys and chimpanzees, they never stop humping one another for crying out loud. No society that I know of, except maybe the Tahitians or the Hawaiians, learn to live with this sexual energy and learn how to harness it. We suppress it and we suppress it to the point where we create pedophilia. We create insane generals who want to bomb people for crying out loud. One of the best articles I ever read about this. Now, John Kennedy was no saint and he never pretended to be. Most men who are a type personalities Most artists that I know, most creative people I know, are highly sexual. They could have sex all day long until they're 90 years of age, for crying out loud, because it is a prime force of nature. There is absolutely no question about that. So we have have not learned to harness it. And we have created a society that is totally, totally dysfunctional. And we are now separated from one another by these iPhones and by these computers. There are no large social gatherings much anymore. And look at how harmful they become. Look at the shooting here in Las Vegas a couple of months ago. And all of that has been swept under the rug because there is no proof that Paddock was a killer. I mean, they did not extract bullets from the victims and tried to match them to the gun. And you know that in Las Vegas, there are more cameras than there are are chips. There are cameras all over the place. There are no cameras showing Paddock coming into the hotel with sacks and sacks of stuff that he took to his room. And the porter who said he took it to his room said he didn't have any luggage to take to his room. And this guy was shot seven days later coming out of a church in Las Vegas, and he was shot by a rifle. And the police said it was a holdup. Well, you don't hold up somebody from a hundred yards away by shooting him with with a rifle. Now I hate to sound very very negative. No, I, and let me let me tell you something. My audience is very glad to know that you wear your tinfoil hat very tightly because it is a badge of courage. And I did want to get back to uh, Ron Paul for just one second. We know okay. dang well that his family was threatened. And I don't know if you noticed the day that Bernie Sanders got up there and backed Hillary as the candidate to vote for. He had a black eye. He had a shiner under his eye. He was. Yeah. Also. And he spent six hundred thousand dollars on a a lakeside home. Yeah, Yeah. That's that's very true. But also the same thing happened to Ross Perot. Look at how smart Ross Perot was on his own dollar. I remember him buying the time. He was on television with uh, um, uh, Bush. He was on stage with Clinton, and he was in the middle. And he pointed at each one of them and said, if you elect either one of these guys in his Texas twang, you elect either one of these guys, they're going to sign NAFTA and send all your jobs overseas. And indeed, he was right. And he was threatened. And that's why he pulled out. But at he changed the election, and he almost helped change the face of America. That was a moment that I thought was going to be a Frank Capra mo- moment, but it turned into a horror story, like they all turn into horror stories. Well, let's get out of the deep state right now. Uh, you mentioned your television show. I don't know how many in my audience ever knew what show you had. And when you talk about real people, 
Uh, I crack up on Jeff France because you have some incredible stories, especially the one, the one big black guy who pimp for whatever reason. He, you, <laughs> you, you appeared to be petrified, and all he wanted was a real people T-shirt. And oh that, yeah, that was. Oh yes, it's in the book. It's a really, really funny story. Well, you know, the show got a fifty share. That meant that everybody in half of every television set in America was tuned into real people. No show in history had those kind of consistent ratings. None of them, except the wonderful shows like Lucy and MASH and All in the Family. When they went off, they all had a huge share, like 50 share, but not every week. They won their time slots every week, but real people was just a runaway monster hit. And we also got legislation passed. We played the major role in getting that wall built in the Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. And almost nobody knows it except us. We got the Missing Children's Act passed for Adam Walsh, uh, for John Walsh's, the murder of his son, Adam. We got a presidential citation for the Navajo Code Talkers. We did more in three years and 60 minutes did in 30 years. That's how strong the show was. And real people T-shirts, you could get anything with them. Well, the story that I tell in the book is about my assistant who was like 56 years of age, and he was on Hollywood Boulevard and on his way home. And he he was approached by a uh, young woman who was a hooker and wanted to know if he needed some company for a few dollars. And he said he didn't have a few dollars and she just, they wanted to talk. And so he, he's a, an inveterate smoker. So he opens his, his jacket to uh, get his cigarettes and his lighter. And she sees his real people t-shirt. <laughs> so she says the real people t-shirt would be payment enough. But anyway, so th- that's what happened. But I remember I had to do a story in uh, Wisconsin in the dead of winter and my cameraman was in Detroit and we couldn't get a plane. He couldn't get on a commercial plane. So they went to a private, uh, a private airline and a pilot said that he would fly us for $500, fly him for $500 and a couple of real people t-shirts. And that's how we got to uh, Wisconsin so we could do the story. I mean, it was just <laughs> enormous. But there are scores and scores of the, these great stories in in the book. And even though I may sound negative about America, I am not negative at all. As a matter of fact, you cannot live without hope. And I I I I feel very positive about life. Because the truth is, no matter what country you're in, you can be in Russia or China or Japan, Okinawa, Hawaii, you can be anywhere in the world, under any system in the world. But those people who are smart enough to play the system and know the system can get by and earn a living. And that's what, you know, and I feel like I'm a survivor. I have never, ever, Bill, done anything for money in my life. As a matter of fact, when Frank Sinatra wanted me to write special material for him, because when they did the revival of Laugh-In, and it turned out that my material was only material he liked, and he made a point of finding me and introducing himself to me, and the real creator of Laugh-In, a guy named Digby Wolf, was standing near us, and Digby said to him, you know, Mr. Sinatra, he did, he did an album called It's Tough to Be White. And Sinatra howled. He said, you did, kid. You got balls. I got to get Sammy to listen to that. Will you send me a copy? And I said, well, you know, it didn't do very well. And he said, I don't care. I'll judge for myself. So anyway, not only did he love the album, he sent me a letter. And I have it in my office right now. He wanted me to be his opening act. But I was too busy to be doing that, so I couldn't. I was working in television, so I became his uh, private writer. And often he would come to me and he'd say, I'm doing, uh, Hubert Humphreys has cancer, and they're doing a tribute to Hubert Humphreys. Would you write my stuff for me? So I would write it, and I would, 
and he would give me a thousand dollars in cash if I wrote one line or if I wrote ten pages. It was always a thousand in cash. And I said, I don't want it. He said, if you don't take it, you don't write anymore. So I took it. And so, and we parted sadly over the, uh, the, uh, the death of Robert Kennedy. And that story is, is, uh, is in my book, book also. So I'm very confident about, I'll be very happy when the book is out there. Hopefully it'll be up sometime the end of January or so. And then also, uh, I did a special show two weeks ago with Jesse Ventura. Uh, Jesse contacted me three and a half weeks ago and asked me to send him some DVDs of my movie, which I did. Then we did a special show with him. And then in while we were on the air, and it, it replays, by the way, on Christmas, December 25th, so people can tune in and listen to this hour with uh, Jesse Ventura. And you will hear him ask me to come on his, he has a new show on Russian TV called The World According to Jesse, which he says is totally uncensored. He has total freedom. And he said he wants me to come on in February to show excerpts of the film and to talk about it. And I said, well, we could do it in November. He said, no, John, we got to strike while the iron's hot. And he says this on the air. Now, if that happens, Bill, and I am on his show, it will get the largest audience ever for my movie. And therefore, it'll get a larger audience for my book, which I hope will be out on Kimball and Amazon at about the same time. But sadly, it's going to cost a whole lot more than, than $2. But it'll be a heck of a read. Yeah, and uh, I may have taken away some of your audience, because if you remember correctly, I edited that interview with Jesse Ventura and I put it on my YouTube channel where those in my audience can go to Mr. Purple Tie and they'll see this interview with Jesse Ventura. But that's fine. Listen, anything to spread the word. You didn't take any audience away from me. <laughs> you know. just added audience. And and you you told me how much you appreciated the opening of that video. And Oh, I got, it was terrific. I mean you do really terrific work. You know, congratulations. Except that I did have the last word on the assassination on Amazon for about two and a half or three years. And it sold a lot just on word of mouth. And I eventually had to take it down because I used somebody else's site and he began keeping the money and wasn't sending me. I, You know, I told him if he puts it up, he can have 25 percent because I've never done anything for money ever in my life. Uh, but I don't, I didn't want to be cheated by a friend. So I discontinued that on Amazon. So I am very, very curious as to how it works. Now I know it's working great for the movie and I'm just curious about a book. I mean, how large a book? If my book is 800 pages, can Amazon print a book that size? Uh, my, my, my son who is helping me enormously bless his heart. Fortunately, you know, he, he is one of the writers and co-executive producers of Criminal Minds, and he got a large raise this year, and he called me. He said, Dad, I don't need a father anymore. I need an exemption. Do you need any <laughs> money for anything? <laughs> so anyway, when I went, to, when I went to DC and spent two weeks that I was there for two weeks because of the CIA files release, we had a free screening at American University with standing room only. I spoke to the McClendon group at the press club, the standing room only, and we had another screening at a place called uh, Mott House and did a number of radio shows. And if it had not been for my son helping me, I couldn't have afforded to have have, uh, have done it. And we put out a press release that had a potential audience of 14 million people. And, of course, it costs money to put out that kind of thing. So I and my son has asked me, about what it is that I could find out of what Amazon really does. And I do know they created the video for the last word on the assassination, which was wonderful, even though we supplied the artwork. And I must tell you, quite honestly, the book cover that we designed for my book is enough to sell a book. You wouldn't even have to look inside. Just the cover itself and the back page 
are so interesting. You would buy it for that if you could put your friend in touch with me oh, so I could definitely. ask but him like those questions. Like I question. said, uh, just because you're a number one seller on Amazon doesn't mean that Amazon is producing your book. It's just that they, they are the chain that will sell it. That's right. That's right. That, that, that's, that I know. And, and, uh, uh my dear friend and, uh, uh, associate producer on this movie, Gino Minari, has his own printing presses and stuff. He's got about 11 businesses here in Vegas. He's extremely successful. He thinks that he, he could probably, uh, print and bind, uh, a large paperback of about Eight or nine hundred pages. He couldn't do a hardcover though. But I'm not thinking about a hardcover. You know, I have a bunch of uh, soft cover books that are great reads, and I love them. And I don't need to have a hardcover book. I just love uh, having a book in my hand. I love reading a book. I myself am an author, and I bought more books than I sold. But yes, it is. <laughs> it, yeah, I wrote a book called The Earth Code at Hand. And if the back cover doesn't get you to read what's inside, anyway, sir, this is such an honor. And, yes, definitely, uh, I'm going to uh, send Brooks a copy of your DVD, if that's okay with you. And oh, I, absolutely. And I will hook. John, you know, I, I, I love nothing better than when, when, when I write to you and you write back to me. I'm on a windy golf course, like, you know, don't bother me. <laughs> but you never oh, that Oh, by the way, in case yeah. oh. you've forgotten, the title of my book is called Your Mother's Not a Virgin. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's so uh, typical of you. <laughs> the agent, the agent that wanted to sell it said it was, he said six bestsellers. He said it's the best title he ever heard for, about a book. And very quickly, I'll tell you how it happened. When I first uh, booked Jim Garrison in 1970 on my AM show, I had accidentally gone into a bookstore and picked up Heritage of Stone, which is was his his book. And I read stuff in there about that I never heard of in the media about how he had to sue Time Life to get to the Zapruder film, and how when they cross examined one of the defense witnesses. A guy named uh, uh, Zink, who was supposed to perform the ot- one of the autopsy, the autopsy at Bethesda, but, but was pre- uh, prevented from it. And I had never heard the fact that this guy had said the general stopped me from performing the autopsy. Well, I got so excited about reading all of this stuff that I never saw mainstream media, and I called Mister Garrison. And he answered the phone directly. And I identified myself, and I said, I, I, I host this show in L.A., won my first Emmy, and I just finished reading your book, Heritage of Stone. And he said, oh, John, you yeah, must be the other one because I only sold two copies. <laughs> so anyway, we started to, to chuckle and talk, and he said, you're never going to get away with booking me. I said, I am. We're the most popular show here. So he finally agreed to do it. And when we were talking, you told, and this yeah. was 1970. He said, John, do you realize that the Harris poll just came out and said 83% of all Americans in 1970 either don't believe Oswald acted alone or was even involved with it, but only 23% want another real investigation. And he says, what does that say about us? And right away I said to him, Mr. Garrison, this is what it says to me. I know. What my mother and father did in the rumble seat in the car, or they did on the pool table, or in the uh, alleyway, or in bed. But do not ever tell me that my mother's not a virgin. Well, he <laughs> howled. And he, that's the title of the book. Because it's like a belief in God, or a belief that Lee Harvey Oswald still did it. To believe in the purity of your mother. Your mother enjoys sex. It's hard for people to realize. They can't accept it way to tell people that this is a book about the truth and the truth is bill i'm so glad you asked me to be on your show and we will do it again after the first of the year you get better and we have a great holiday and we'll chat again next year and you too sir and thank you so very much very very much talk to you later good Good, night good night